Eschatology is in the tradition of prophecy in the Bible, invented the doctrine of the rapture. Either love God and hate money or hate God and love money. The kingdom of God meant the kingdom of heaven, and that's where you go after you die. There are no people, no religions, no churches. And look at what the Egyptians do. They make people slaves. We have to mind our mind. Welcome to the Impact Nations podcast. My name is Tim. I am your host. And today we are continuing our series in which I speak with authors who have written fascinating books that have captured my attention. Uh, and today is no different. We are speaking with Brian McLaren. Uh, Brian is an author. He's an activist. Uh, he was a longtime pastor. Uh, he has written a new book, uh, this one right here. It's called Life After Doom. And we're going to talk about it today. Brian, welcome to the show. So happy to be with you, Tim. We're delighted to have you. Um, I'm excited to talk about this book. I, I hopefully we'll find a balance uh, between these these two words, the life and the doom, uh, so we <laughs> yes. don't spend too much time on the doom. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, we yes. want to leave our folks encouraged today, but uh, it, first, it's important to kind of kind of look at uh, where we're at before we can talk about where we're going, I suppose. Um, this book, fascinating. Uh, I mean, you've got, you're referencing all sorts of material in here, everything from Darwin and his survival of the fittest uh, stuff to, to uh, singer, songwriter, children's songwriter, Rafi. Uh, so, I mean, you got everything in here. Um, life after doom. Maybe I guess we need to start, Brian, by just talking about what is this doom of which you speak? Because uh, that could mean a lot of different things. <laughs> so what are you focused on? A lot of people uh, look at our world and see not just one problem, but they see two, three, four, five. And all of these problems seem to be avalanching or accumulating problems. And when we think about solving one, the other cluster of problems make it harder to solve that problem. And this sense yeah. that we have accumulating, interconnected, uh, uh, cascading challenges right now leaves a lot of people feeling totally overwhelmed. And that feeling of overwhelm, that feeling like there's no way we can get through this, is the feeling of doom. Um, yeah. And so I'm not using doom to talk about uh, an actual event. I'm using it to talk about the experience of a feeling that, well, here, here's a way to say it. Um, there might be a way through this mess, but I don't see, I don't see the way. And, and what do I do when I have that feeling of overwhelm? Yeah. And you actually kind of at the beginning of the book, almost give us four potential outcomes of, of where we're going, the trajectory we're going. And as far as I could tell, the very best outcome you were projecting was still probably a couple of centuries of really crappy stuff going on. Yeah. I, s sometimes, uh, you know, for people like me who do a deep dive into the research and, and have been interested in this for a long time, um, it's not like we have any great options, but I think it's important to realize if we go back to any period in the past and we were, you know, if we could go back to 1820 and think what would the next uh, 100 years hold, or if we were to go to 1920 and look at what the next 100 years would hold, it's not like we would say, oh, these are going to, it's going to be a great century, uh, you know, a, a Sunday school picnic is ahead. Yeah. Each century has faced significant uh, challenges. And, um, and I, I, I think our best scenarios are, have, have real challenges ahead. And, you know, for those of us who are people of deep faith, especially deep Christian faith, well, that shouldn't surprise us. You know, uh, Jesus said in this world, you will have trouble, you'll have tribulation. And, uh, and, and I think one of the myths of our culture is, that if we could just fix this, if we could just fix that, if we could just mm. have our candidate win for the next election, whatever it yes. is, that that some silver bullet would fix all of our problems. And and we're having to get a little more mature and and face no, it's it, we've got a challenging road ahead. Whatever of those four scenarios might unfold. Yeah, you use a phrase uh, in the book. I think it's actually one of your chapter titles, but like uh, "Welcome to Reality," which when I first read it, I'll be honest, Brian, I, I was like, "Well, that's a rather snarky comment," but you actually described it as a as a helpful. Um, almost coming to grips with reality helps you to move forward in that. Can you just talk to us a little bit about this 
concept of welcome to reality? Sure. So, uh, uh, Tim, I've been super interested in the last, oh, I don't know, 10 years or so uh, in the subject of bias, um, biases. Biases are are features of our brain, features of our thinking, features of our thought patterns that actually make us not see reality. <laughs> mm. um, the, the, the most famous is called confirmation bias. And confirmation bias says that it is very hard to see something that doesn't fit in with what you already see. Um, we, we like information that confirms what we already think, and we tend to reject information that disturbs what, what we already think. And what, what me, that means is very often we compose this understanding of reality that is what we wish it would be. Uh, and when reality doesn't seem to fit with what we rich, wish it would be, you know, we, we try to make it fit. And when it doesn't, that causes us an awful lot of uh, anxiety. Uh, because not only are we having to face an unwanted uh, a, a reality that's not what we wish, but it's in conflict with a lot of our assumptions, which might mean that we have to rethink some of our assumptions. Put all that together, and you realize that welcoming reality as it really is is um, is harder than it looks. And, yeah. and to add one other little dimension to that, uh, there is what we what we feel relatively confident about. We can might call that the known future. And then there's the unknown future. And um, when we have to accept both a known future that feels challenging and unknowns, that is even more difficult for our brains to process. You know, for those of us who are familiar with the New Testament, this is where, you know, a passage like I, I memorized as a kid from Philippians 4, um, don't be anxious about anything, uh, but, uh, you know, in prayer with thanksgiving, let let your requests be made known to God, uh, and, and you'll find a peace that goes beyond your understanding. Well, what, what Paul is acknowledging there is that anxiety is always there with us because we, uh, we're anxious about things we can't control. Do you have any... Uh... <laughs> any tips for welcoming reality? Like when, cause I think you're right in terms of this, this feeling of we tend to reject uh, any reality that doesn't line up with our, our presuppositions. Yes. How do we get to that place of just, um, coming to grips with, uh, with what is happening? You know, to me, there, there's a virtue really at the root of this. And it's a virtue that we, we could choose and we could cling to and we could desire and we could pray for. And it's the virtue of honesty, the virtue of wanting truth. Um, you know, we're always torn between wanting truth and wanting comfort. And if we're willing to say, I want the truth, even if it makes me uncomfortable, if we if we develop that desire for truth, you know, there's a whole book in the Bible, it seems to me that uh, that promotes that desire. It's the book of Proverbs where, where the, the values of wisdom and understanding are put in opposition to foolishness and ignorance or, uh, and, or laziness, you know? Um, so that ver desiring that virtue seems to me to be a really good start. And I'll tell you, I, I think we all see this, especially in our culture, in our economy, uh, people really want what makes them money. <laughs> yes. And, and they don't want to see what gets in the way of their making money. To desire truth more than money is another resonance with the book of Proverbs that says, you know, you should seek understanding even more than gold. So to say that to, to be in touch with reality is a treasure worth more than money. That to me is a deeply spiritual quest. It's, it has to do with character and maturity and values and virtues. So, I'm I'm just going to call out the church a little bit because uh, I, I'm sure you spend a fair amount of time speaking in churches and things like that. And you're certainly, I, I know just from your writing, you're very much in tune with social media and all these things. The, the Western church specifically, I think, uh, has 
Uh, I have a reputation for uh, denying one of the one of the largest uh, sources of this doom that you talk about in here is is the uh, the environment, the climate. Yeah. And yeah. Um, you talk about truth, you talk about reality, and science is saying one thing. And yet much of the Western church is wanting to, to reject what science is saying about what we're doing to the planet. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering what you have to say about that. How do you, how do you counsel uh, Christians uh, when they're getting these two very different quote unquote truths being, being pushed their way? So such an important question, Tim. So I might go back and start with one of Jesus most, provocative say, sayings. You know, this is one, I was a preacher for many, many years, and I, I don't know if I ever really preached a whole sermon on this. Uh, it wouldn't have been a popular sermon if I had. But Jesus said, you will either love God and hate money or hate God and love money. <laughs> In other words, <laughs> he says, you can't love both God and and money. Um, And what seems to have happened, if you look back through church history, sometimes it can help us to look back at something in the past that then helps us maybe scrutinize our own thinking in the present. But if you look through history, there were times when our way of making money made uh, Christians twist their understanding of the Bible and of God to help them keep making money. And, and one of the prime examples in American history is slavery. A lot of people don't realize this, but in, in the few decades before the Civil War, there was a huge industry. A, a, it would have been a major shelf on the Christian bookstore, if there were Christian bookstores then, of Christians using the Bible to justify slavery and to say that white people deserve to be in charge and people who aren't white deserve to be slaves. It 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 makes me feel dirty to even say that word those words, but there, this was a major, major thrust. We have denominations in the United States who were formed to preserve that way of thinking and promote that way of thinking. And, uh, and I ask myself, how could people do that? Well, the reason they could do it is because their way of making money depended upon a slave economy. And by the way, it wasn't just in the South, you know, the, a huge amount of the North's wealth came from textile mills that were using the cotton picked by enslaved people. So the North was pro profiting from this uh, economic system too. And if somebody were to dare to question, is it right to exploit human beings and treat them worse than you treat an animal, right? Uh, yeah. a, a, a cow or a horse or whatever. Um, to, to think that that was going on and justified in sermons and in books and with Bible verses and all the rest um, and with denominational structures, you, you just have to say the only way people could do this if, is if they were blinded by some other kind of love. And that love of money, I think, was at the root of it. I think something similar happens today when we have an economy that's built on wealth that requires the exploitation of the earth and the, and the harm harm being done to the earth. You pointed out actually something uh, in one of the later chapters that uh, I'd never noticed in scripture where uh, Jesus is telling the parable of the, the rich man who uh, has so much that he, you know, he doesn't even have storehouses enough. So he's going to have to build more storehouses and stuff. But you pointed out that actually like the scripture says, well, the, the land is what provided. Yes. Uh, and sometimes I think we, Forget that we. Uh, you even talk about the pronouns in there. It's so me-centered that the man in the story is so all about himself uh, that he's forgotten that actually the the land is what has yielded that fruit, that harvest. Um, and we've forgotten that, haven't we? You know, I feel like it, it. It's again, it's almost like a set of glasses we put on that have changed the way we read the whole Bible. Um, you know, you think, for example, in the Genesis story. There are no people, there are no churches, there are no religions. God makes light and says, it's good. You know, there are yeah. no people, no religions, no churches. God makes creatures that swim in the sea and crawl on the earth and fly through the air, and it's good, right? The, there's a goodness to creation uh, that's been there from the first chapter of the Bible. 
goodness means value, inherent value. It's not measured by people and it's not measured by money. It's measured simply in relation to the creator. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and when you read the Bible, trying to pay attention to the goodness of creation, you notice things like all those chapters in Leviticus about how you care for your, your crops, how you care for your soil, how you care for your animals. Um, uh, how you give not only your people a rest one day out of the week, but you give the land a rest, your animals a rest. You give, and not just one day out of the week, but one year out of seven. I mean, and then there was this whole phenomenon of the Jubilee in the Hebrew scriptures. So there's this sense, no, you aren't driven 24 seven for profit. You to, to be alive is to live with a different rhythm and a different value system. Yeah, I was really challenged by by that uh, chapter. You talk about. Uh, let me see if I can find my note here. Yeah, you said it says don't read the Bible, and then it parenthetically in the same old way, which I thought was clever. But it talks about actually uh, reading the Bible as as being within the, a genre of indigenous wisdom, uh, which I thought really interesting because actually. Um, this, this is something I've often thought about Genesis 1 and 2, the creation yes. accounts, uh, and there are accounts, there's two of them, but they, they have always struck me as being very parallel or or the genre is very similar to some indigenous stories of creation that, that we've heard. Um, and I know there are many more than I've ever heard, but um, yeah. could you just talk to us a little bit more? Because it's, it's a rather shocking idea for many evangelicals, I would think, to, yeah. to read the Bible from that angle. But it, it was a really interesting idea. Yeah, it's it's shocking for reasons that we could talk about, but it, it actually is a it's fascinating once you give yourself permission to delve into it. Uh, just this is a tangent, but uh, a, a couple of years ago, my wife gave me uh, Ancestry.com for for my birthday, so I've been learning about my family tree, and mm -hmm. of course, you know now you trace your name, and then you trace, and you can trace your DNA, um, but. And this is just expanding in so many different ways. And one of the things that uh, that uh, anthropologists have been tracing is creation stories. And and one of the really interesting ones is there's the the story of the world being built on the back of a turtle. And you find that story among Native Americans uh, in, in several Native American cultures. But you can trace that story and it goes way back to Central Asia, uh, far, far, far before that. And so it's fascinating how deeply rooted many of these creation stories are. And then when you start to understand them being in dialogue with each other and, and evolving over time, and then you'd say, why would the Jewish, the, the ancient Jewish people tell this the creation story Put a twist on it. Tell a different version of it. Why would they go in this direction with the story? Uh, it just makes me appreciate the biblical stories uh, even more. Just uh, as one quick example. So if we assume that the the Hebrew people are are taking shape and learning to think about God and learning to pray and learning to reach toward God um, with the Egyptian empire at their south, um, uh, well, what's the Egyptian? What's the symbol of uh, on the on the headdress of every pharaoh? It's it's a cobra, a cobra's head, and so you, it makes you think: Could that story of the temptation of the serpent wow. be a way of saying we better be careful, or we'll start thinking like the Egyptians? And look at what the Egyptians do: they make people slaves. They enslave mm. people for this ultra powerful group of nobility at the top. Everyone else, their whole lives exist for the benefit of these people at the top. God doesn't look at it that way. And then, then suddenly the Genesis story just to me pops into 3D because who are the image bearers of God in the Genesis story? Wow. They are what we would call naked hunter gatherers in a garden who have no pyramids, no shadoofs, no irrigation ditches, no technology. The most primal human beings are, are human beings who bear the image of God. I mean, to me, it just suddenly it makes that story be so, so much richer and more powerful. Yeah. Amazing. And certainly not a science textbook. 
<laughs> no, but it, this is, I think, uh, you know, this is what's so ironic. We think we're so smart and that ancient people were so foolish. No, ancient people had a technology of storytelling that mm. was one of their most highly developed technologies, you might say. And, and we modern people have become so obsessed with, and, and these are good things, measuring and weighing and, uh, and calculations and all the rest. Yeah, there's, there's great value in that. But what we've done is we've become kindergartners in the wisdom of storytelling, I think. Wow. Um, you, I, I want to just qu quote something here because I, I, I want to get further thoughts from you, but you, you're talking about at near the beginning of the book, um, like if we're going to put the brakes on this doom and again, to summarize, I, I think much of your book is really talking about the world systems that are leading to the devastation of our planet, uh, which has, uh, <laughs> there is a, an end point coming, it would seem, yeah. uh, and the economic systems that are, are yeah. crushing people and doing further damage to the planet. So if we're going to put the brakes on this doom, you say we're going to need creativity, imagination, collaboration, and courage. But many of our spirit strengthening institutions and movements are also currently in disarray, sharing in the division, corruption and malaise of the civilization as a whole. Can you talk to us? What are these spirit strengthening institutions that you're talking about that are, are really not able to guide us the way they ought? Sure. Well, well, let's start with our churches. I mean, uh, uh, and and obviously the Christian religion is the biggest religion on the planet. About 31 to 33 percent of people in the world identify as Christians. The Roman Catholic Church is the single biggest religious institution in the world. Um, uh, uh, but and Pentecostalism actually as a sort of interrelated movement is is almost as large in today's world. Um, Islam is the second biggest uh Hinduism used to be the third biggest. Now, what we might say is um, the spiritual but not religious or secular or unaffiliated is now a little bit bigger than Hinduism as far as we know. But if we look at all of our religious institutions that should be leading the way in building virtue, building uh, uh, con concern for the least of these, building uh, a, a challenge to the power of money, um, teaching people how dangerous dictators and autocrats can be, uh, building in people that virtue, that desire for truth and honesty that we were talking about before. It's just pretty obvious that that they're not keeping up. You know, they're, the, the the change is happening so fast that they're not keeping up. But it's not just it's not just in religion. The same thing we see in education, both if we want to talk about education of young children or uh, in in higher education, um, our education systems that I think we were so proud of when I was growing up. Now, I think we all know that are uh, they're they're really facing stresses and and challenges. Um, you, you think about even things. Well, it just feels like every dimension of civil life is. Uh, it is being politicized and weaponized and people can are, are losing trust in each other and um and certain people profit by that uh certain kinds of politicians profit by it and sadly certain religious leaders profit by it in other religions but also in christianity in other words you see in them not a concern for truth not a concern for the common good but a concern to raise amens, to raise dollars, to raise members, to raise energy levels, to hype people up. And look, I was a preacher. I've been a preacher for most of my life. And I know there is something that when you know this will preach, meaning this will rile people up, it's a temptation that can make you say things that aren't completely true. And so yeah, it, it and and that that's it's so pervasive. It's it's part of what we, why I think we need deep change and and why we can't give up on our faith communities, um, because it it's not like there's some better organization waiting to fill in the gap when they fail. As you interact with faith communities and perhaps most especially leaders in the Christian church, uh, and and you've been talking to them about this 
<laughs> welcome to reality, this, hey, we need to face reality thing. Have you had pushback? Are, are people oh, yeah. ready to engage as a, as a prophetic people? Or are they wanting to keep their head in the sand and say, no, we've got our systems that benefit us, uh, benefit me as a leader, if you will, uh, and I'm not interested in facing reality? Well, uh, because I understand confirmation bias that we were talking about before, when people hear something I say and it doesn't fit in with what they already think, and when they uh, when they immediately react to or reject something I might say, I don't take it personally. I understand these things are hard. I'm the same way. We all have this confirmation bias, and it takes real spiritual work and pursuit of spiritual maturity to to face that. But um, let let me give you an example from outside the Christian faith that might help those of us who are Christians see how this operates in the Christian faith. And I want to protect confidentiality here, but I have a dear friend who is a rabbi. And uh, as a, a rabbi, she has deep love for this, the state of Israel. But as a rabbi, she has deep love for this, the scriptures, the Torah, and the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures teach her that God cares about the oppressed. God cares about the widow and orphan. Um, God cares about the alien and stranger. I mean, this is so deeply written through the Hebrew scriptures, right? So some years ago, she uh, it was a time when uh, the state of Israel had invaded Gaza for a short term. Uh, there were there was some a lot of bombs that fell in both directions, and a lot of children were killed. Of course, right now we're seeing this multiplied over hundredfold. Mm -hmm. But she, in a sermon, said, "Because of my commitment to the scriptures, I believe that the death of a Palestinian child grieves God." just as the death of an Israeli child grieves God. She then received death threats from her fellow Jews um, and some vile, vile death threats. Well, I just saw she just, again, took an incredible risk to say something similar now about what's happening in uh, Israel and Gaza now. And she and and the threat comes from her her fellow Jews. And I read the comments, on, you know, on social media under what she said, and I just thought, what incredible courage she has to say these words. Um, and and it's absolutely predictable what some of her people of her religion do. Well, when you see it in another religious context, sometimes it helps you then bring that back to our own religious context. And you see the same kind of thing happening so often in the Christian community. You mentioned social media. There's a phrase, <laughs> doom scrolling, which I, I was reminded of as I read your book. And you you talk about it because like for your job, for your role, you, you spend time in social media. You are an activist uh, in part. Uh, and so that's the sphere you're in on a regular basis. What? Um, it's interesting. I was just reading an article that, uh, it was 20 years ago, uh, this year that, uh, Facebook was originally invented by Zuckerberg. Is and, that so? uh, yeah. And so, uh, it was, it was an interesting article. Actually, it was mentioning that, uh, Facebook was invented and the, the apprentice was launched the, the television <laughs> show. And it said, see what was coming. We should have known. Um, uh, but oh anyway, um, what would you, how do you counsel people who are, stuck in this addiction, if you will, to social media, to doom scrolling, to being told all of the bad things, terrible things that are happening around the world and telling them how they should think, how they should respond to these things uh, in this very extremist polarized world that we live in. You know, I am still struggling with that myself for myself. And then I have four adult children and their spouses, and I have five grandchildren. And I just think for all of us, we're, we're, you know, this is, uh, it's like a new set of challenges we didn't, we, we, we weren't prepared for. Um, in, in the book, it's why uh, I, I wrote a chapter in the book called Mind Your Mind. Um, I think we're at a time as never before where we have to mind our mind. We have to say, I, I need to be aware of what I'm putting into my mind, and I need to be aware of how my mind is reacting to the realities around me. I really, in many ways, I, I, one of the most precious verses to me in the New Testament 
comes from Romans 12. Don't be conformed to this world. Don't let this world squeeze you into its mold, um, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so this sense that the the deepest battle is is the battle uh, the battle that takes place inside all of us. And um, so I, I suppose if I were to offer a suggestion to people in this regard, and not that I have this all worked out, it's it's a struggle for all of us, but here's what I'd say, that we should beware of people who always tell us the enemy is somewhere else. Mm. Um, and instead we should realize, as Paul said in Romans 12, that the battle is in our own mind. And what's going on out there it very often tra taps into things in our own mind that are going to then cause us to overreact or underreact or uh, exaggerate or uh, deny. And so the, the need in times like these to not be conformed to this world, to not let other things put us, make us puppets on their string, whether it's religious leaders or political leaders or advertisers or ideologues or whatever, or, or just people who are trying to suck our attention in because they make money for every second that we keep watching <laughs> and clicking yes. on their content, <laughs> um, to not be squeezed and, you know, manipulated by those forces, but to seek a renewal of our mind, something else that's happening inside of us. Yeah. Do you find yourself sometimes counseling people to just take a giant step away from uh, both social media and news media in general? I have been doing that myself, um, uh, especially over the last year or so. And, um, and I think it's, you know, we're in, a, in an election year, and this is a year when a whole lot of people are investing a whole lot of money to make us think what they think, whether or not that's the truth and the whole truth. Yeah. So, um, yeah. It's an important time for us to become far more judicious in where we where we invest the precious commodity of our attention. Yeah. Ooh, that's good. The precious commodity of our attention. Uh, folks, we are hanging out with Brian McLaren. We're talking to him about his brand new book, Life After Doom. Uh, Brian, I want to ask some questions about our eschatology, uh, where all this is going. I want to talk a little bit about the kingdom of God and the, the implications for us in this context. Um, but just before I do that, I want to uh, pause for a, a station break, if you will. Um, you know, one of the... Um, one of the things that I, I've been doing recently is working on some clean water projects around the world. At Impact Nations, we uh, we believe Jesus began a work, and Brian, you and I are going to talk about this in a few minutes, of the restoration of all things. We believe the gospel really is about restoring life to the way God intended it to be. And so that's what we get to do around the world at Impact Nations. We're bringing restoration, rescue to people who are in desperate situations. And uh, one of those things is actually clean water. Um because of what we're doing to our planet, um, but also just because of where people live, sometimes the, their water is not safe. It's not clean. Uh, I just came back from Uganda. We were in several villages and an urban slum where I the water sources were horrific. Uh, I'm talking like at one point uh, we were in this urban slum and children are coming and gathering water from this little pool that is being fed by rainwater that's come all the way down into the valley where this uh, slum is. And it's just washed through all of the trash and everything. And now the children are drinking it and it's horrendous. Um, but the cool thing is that we have a solution for that, which is the Sawyer water filter, which will instantly uh, take all of the germs out of that water, make it 99.997% pure or something like that. It's incredible. Uh, it's, it's so much fun to see families suddenly get this gift of clean water and then get to tell them about Jesus and and all that stuff too. So um, if you want to learn more about that, just head to impactnations.com slash water. Um, got a whole page there. It's cool. Actually, you can see right on a map, you can see where all of the water filters are installed around the world because we do a GPS uh, little tag on each one of those filters uh, when we install them. Uh, we take surveys so you can see how the water filter is making a difference, not just in their health, but also in their uh, in their uh, economic status as well, as they're no longer spending money on medicine or uh, burning, uh, like having to purchase wood and, and fuel and stuff, charcoal to uh, boil their water uh, or purchase water. All these things change like overnight. It's amazing. So um, if you want to participate in the restoration of all things, uh, just a really simple way to do it is get a family some clean water. It's 75 bucks. We'll get them a, a water filter 
filter that'll last a lifetime. Just head to impactnations.com slash water, learn more about that, and then hang out on our website. There's just incredible stories all over the place of people who are seeing absolute life transformation uh, as a result of the Impact Nations family uh, all over the world. So thank you to all who are giving. Uh, we're, we're having a blast with you. Seeing God's kingdom come. Um, all right, Brian. Speaking of kingdom come, uh, Jesus had this really strange phrase uh, where he said, the kingdom of God is within you. And as I've always wrestled with that phrase. because, What does that even mean? But you actually kind of draw it out a little bit in this book in a really helpful way. Could you just talk about what does it mean to have the kingdom of God within you and how can that actually help us? In our current times, as we look at this, uh, the trajectory of our planet, uh, the trajectory of our political systems, of our economic systems, what does it mean to have the kingdom of God within us and how can that help us? Well, you know, can I tell you a quick story uh, about yeah. this? Um, uh, oh, this is back in the 90s and I was uh, uh, still a relatively young pastor and there was this famous author uh, who was going to be in town. And uh, this was before I'd written any books. So I was really impressed with authors. Now I'm not mm. so impressed. Authors are just normal people who <laughs> are, you know, have some obsession with writing. But uh, uh, I, I reached out to his secretary. I, I'd only ever done this one time before. His books had helped me so much. Um, and I arranged to meet him for lunch while he was in town. And I, I was very nervous. Uh, and we're sitting in this Chinese restaurant. And uh, he was very well respected in the evangelical world. And I'm not going to say his name, um, but he said to me, uh, as, we're, as we're talking, well, he said, Brian, most evangelicals don't have the foggiest notion of what the gospel really is. And I thought, what do you mean? We evangelicals, we're all about the gospel. That's what evangelical means. And uh, so I, I just remember I was had hot and sour soup and I was looking down in the soup. I didn't want to look up, you know, because I felt like it was an auction and I'd have to answer his question. So he says, so, for example, Brian, uh, how would you define the gospel? And so I sort of felt put on the spot and now I was really nervous. And I talked about justification by grace through faith and a lot of things from the book of Romans and so on. And he says, well, that's exactly what most evangelicals would say. And he was an evangelical himself. And so I'm feeling very betrayed. And then he said, um, I said, well, how would you define the gospel? And at this point, I'm a little defensive. And he said, well, shouldn't we let Jesus define the gospel? He said, for Jesus, the gospel was the kingdom of God is at hand. And all I can tell you um, is that at that moment, I realized I had no idea what he was talking about <laughs> mm. <laughs> because for me, the kingdom of God meant the kingdom of heaven. And that's where you go after you die. And so I, I remember uh, after that, I don't even remember much of the rest of our conversation because I was so disturbed, you know, it was like my mind was blown and I went home and I thought, I've got to figure out what Jesus meant by that term kingdom of God. And, and the first thing I, or one of the first things I noticed was that Jesus in the Lord's prayer taught us to pray, may your kingdom come, may your will be done. Now, the first thing I noticed, it wasn't, may we go to your kingdom. It was, may your kingdom mm -hmm. come to us. Yeah. And then I, the second thing I noticed was that may your will be done seemed to be an example of Hebrew parallelism, where you say the same thing twice in slightly different ways. So, May your kingdom come, may your will be done, meant may your, your, your kingdom means the place where your will is done. So mm -hmm. when children are having to drink polluted water, that's not God's will. God's not happy when children get diarrhea and get sick and some die and, and they miss school. And there's all kinds of cascading problems that result from not having clean water. So then suddenly you say, well, if God's will is being done, then children get clean water to drink. And moms and dads yeah. and grandpas and grandmas get clean water to drink. And it just revolutionized my way of thinking. So then what happens, I think, is instead of getting my soul into heaven after I die as being the primary focus of the gospel, 
It's getting God's desires, what God wishes, what God dreams of, what God longs for, getting that from heaven down into my heart in this world yeah. so that then I live that out in this world. That's beautiful. Hmm. And we, and it's participatory, right? Like, cause the, cause the other, the other thing is uh, ultimately like, I don't know, I just like Jesus will f figure it out, but in, instead he's actually called us to be a part of the family business. Like we we're, we're enlisted. It's not just like now we sit back and wait. I prayed the prayer. Now I'll sit back and wait until it's all over, but rather I get to participate in what God's doing. In fact, there's this beautiful phrase uh, that my Jewish friends use. Uh, the phrase is tikkun olam. And tikkun olam means the healing of the world, um, the, the restoration of the world, the, the repair of, of a world that is being torn by human greed and arrogance and pride and lies and deceit. And um, so this joining of God in the healing of the world feels to me like what it really means to experience salvation. It's not like a just a ticket to heaven after you die. It's joining God in the healing of the world, participating in tikkun olam. Yeah. Uh, and, and what's so beautiful about that is that affects suddenly every moment of every day of life. It, you know, I'm, I'm at the grocery store and this, the uh, person at the checkout counter, you know, she looks like she's really exhausted, really having a tough time. And instead of thinking, she looks tired, I'm not getting my quality of service. And it's all mm. about me. I think yeah. because I join, I'm joining God in the healing of the world. I think what a blessing that God brought me to this line, uh, checkout line. So maybe I can add a little word of encouragement to her in the three minutes that I have while I'm getting my Cheerios or whatever it is. And, and so I, I can stop at that moment and think, how can I bring a, a, some bit of blessing? So, so God's desire for her isn't to be treated like a piece of furniture, but to be recognized as a human being. That's beautiful and challenging. One of the things that I like about that too, Brian, is it, uh, for those of us who perhaps don't feel that we are uh, evangelists at heart, right? Um, there is sometimes there's great pressure that can come from the church. If you got to get people to pray the prayer, you got to be telling people the gospel, et cetera, et cetera. When we are joining God in the healing of the world, in those little micro moments throughout the day, we're like the the lady at the checkout at the grocery store. We're no longer thinking, well, I just need to tell her about Jesus and I got to get her to 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 repent and turn to Jesus. But rather, I just need to give her a little taste of life as it's intended to be today. I need to participate in healing in her world, in in building her up and showing her beauty today. Uh, and that seems easier. <laughs> Oh my gosh, it's a it's a joy. It's a joy and a privilege. Uh, if I can just tell you uh, another a quick story of uh, something that happened to me years ago. I was driving when my kids were little. They're they're all now in their upper thirties and forties. But when they were little, I was driving one of them to school, and it was winter time in Maryland. And we're driving down the road, and out of just the corner of my left eye, I saw what looked like a person lying in the street, a, a little side street. And I said to my son, I think somebody's hurt over there. And so we did a U-turn and came around. And there was this tall, thin, uh, black man lying. And it was a very cold morning. There was ice. He was literally lying spread eagle on the street. And there was a little boy on the curb crying. So I pulled my car over and I got out. And I said, what happened? And this man had fallen and um, on the ice. He was from Ethiopia. He'd never been on ice. He was visiting his grandson wow. for the first time. And he slid on the ice. And it turned out his femur was broken. It was actually a Ooh. very, very serious injury. Yeah. And, um, and, he, oh, and he had flip-flops on because he didn't have warm shoes. And his, so he was barefoot. His flip-flops had slid across the ice. So we got his flip-flops. We got him. It was very hard to get him lying down in the car, the little grandson who was crying. And we figured out where they lived and got him home. And it was, you know, but I just remember it, like, I didn't think what a drag I have to help somebody today. I felt like what an incredible honor that I get to be of service to somebody who, because if the spirit of God is alive in me, uh, the spirit of God cares about that man. And so, you know, I, I just remember feeling like, 
how blessed I am to get to be of service to somebody today. Now, look, there are days when we're all busy or we have our own problems and we might not be able to, to cross the road to help somebody in need. But most days, if we have our eyes open, we'll see it as a privilege. And the irony is, you know, there, there, there are few joys in life better than being able to be an agent of God's love. I mean, I, you, I, I could tell you feel it in, in inviting people to give some money to help children get clean water. And, and anyone who contributes to that, they're going to feel a surge of joy because that's what we were made for. We were, that's made, what we were to, made for to join yes. God. Yeah. 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 We're, we're just operating the way we were designed to function. <laughs> exactly. Right. Exactly. You know, and this comes back to the renewing of our minds. When we think that the greatest joy in life is making more money or defeating somebody else, you know, mm. Oh my gosh, that's, that's a, tw that's distortion. That's being conformed to somebody else's agenda. Not, not God's dreams wow. for the world. All right. As, as we wrap up, I want to come back to where it's all going. Um, because I, I will admit, Brian, I, I read one of the opening chapters of your book, I think maybe chapter two or something. Uh, and it was kind of depressing, uh, as you, as you kind of laid out these four scenarios of, and one of them basically saying, Hey, this all could just come to a crashing halt and the <laughs> extinction of life on earth. Um, and uh, and then you actually it's cool, by the way, each of your chapters finishes with a little almost like a letter to the reader, which I really just dear reader. And I love that. Um, and that one at the end, you're like, all right, you made it to the end of the of the hardest <laughs> chapter. So, you know, congrats. It, it'll get better from here, I promise, which I appreciated. I needed the nudge. Um, but it it was a little depressing at the beginning to think through it with the current trajectory of the way we are depleting this planet of its resources, the way we are heating this planet up, uh, the way our political systems are not at all set up to put a stop to it. Um, it in the natural without our faith, without our scriptures, we could see it as coming to an inevitable point, you know, on a collision course with, with the end of the world as we know it. Uh, and yet we've read the scriptures. We know that, as we've already said, Jesus in the, is in the business of restoring all things of, of redeeming, uh, life and creation. We know that we are heading towards a new heaven and a new earth. How can our eschatology help guide us in these times? Because I think in it could have one effect of like, hey, you know what? God's going to fix it all in the end anyway. So let's just burn the thing down. Who cares? He can he can fix it. Um, or there's a like, no, we've got to do it. We've got to do it and not actually invite Jesus into the process. Uh, those are probably two extremes. What's what's the right answer? You know, the, the subject of eschatology is super interesting. I, I came from the little tiny denomination or sect that invented the doctrine of the rapture. We, it, it, oh. The doctrine of the rapture never existed in Christian history until the 1830s, and it was my little uh, denomination that that uh, came, came up with this. Um, and I'll just say, I, I think eschatology is a super, well, it, it's a little bit like uh, teaching children about sex. You know, mm. it, it, you don't want to tell people things that are untrue that could cause them a lot of harm in many different ways. And you don't want to tell them things that are true when they're not ready to handle it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so eschatology to me is, is a lot like that. Uh, people get a hold of it and use it in really, really harmful ways. And, and so if you were to ask me, what is the, a healthy way to think about eschatology? Here's, here's what I would say. Um, uh, well, there, there, there's, there's so much we, we should, we could do five podcasts just about that question. So let me uh, sweep away a lot of things that we could talk about. And I'll just say this. I think eschatology is in the tradition of prophecy in the Bible. And prophecy in the Bible is not, I do not believe, is foretelling the future as if the future were written in stone. I think prophecy in the Bible is warning people about where their current behavior will lead. Now, here's the interesting thing. In this way, the purpose of a prophecy 
is a warning. And the purpose of a warning is that it won't happen. <laughs> because if you warn somebody that if you keep doing what you're doing, here's going to be the inevitable result, and people listen, then the result will be different. And the great example of this in the Bible is the book of Jonah. I was just going to say, it really ticked off Jonah, but... <laughs> that's Exactly. Jonah would rather have a terrible end for the people of Nineveh because it would prove him right in his prophecy. Yeah. And God then says, you know, uh, you, you, don't, you just don't get it. So, in fact, that might be the very best book for people to read and really ponder in a deep way to see the heart of God about this. So what I would say is what, what the best work of eschatology is to warn us about about where our current path is leading so that we can have a change of heart. The biblical word for that we know is repentance. Repentance doesn't just mean feeling guilty. It means it means rethinking our current way of life and to to see where it's going to lead, which then opens us to the possibility of of change for the better. Change that makes us say, instead of seeking my own wealth, my own personal power and pleasure, Instead of seeking power and pleasure for my political party or my religious group or my race alone, I'm going to join God and open my span of concern as wide as the heart of God's span of concern, which is for everyone and everything, and not just all people, but the birds of the air and the flowers of the field and the fish of the sea that, that God loves. When we allow our hearts to be stretched in that way, then a different future becomes possible. Mm. Yeah, which which for me just points right back to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, right? I, I think seek first the kingdom and all these other things yes. will be added to you. Like, hey, you'll, you'll, those things will come, but seek the kingdom, which as you've said, the kingdom is God's will being done on earth. It's, it is life as God intended it to be. Uh, yes. I think about the, the Beatitudes, right? Uh, just a, a few verses before that where he, Jesus says, hey, uh, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness or probably just as well translated justice, right? Life as yes. God intended it to be. Uh, yes. Is it possible that if we actually just did what Jesus told us to do, that maybe we wouldn't find ourselves in this current predicament? And maybe <laughs> even if we just started right now, things could get a little bit better? <laughs> well, let's uh, let's just say that even if we seek to do Jesus, to live as Jesus lived, even if we seek to live, and join God in the healing of the world, and we do it imperfectly, I think we'll be way better off than if we mm. don't even seek it. So yeah. that's, that's to me, that, that's a pretty low bar to even, to make progress. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not making it so far, Brad. <laughs> Uh, this has been fabulous. I know you've got another commitment you need to get to, so we'll, we'll end it there. But folks, if this is uh, wet your whistle, so to speak, uh, grab this book. It's going to be available. We're, we're a little ahead of schedule, but it, are pre-orders available right now if people want to yeah, get their pre hands on it? Awesome. Comes out in mid May. Yeah. Awesome. So this is Life After Doom, Wisdom and Courage for a World Falling Apart. Uh, and uh, it, it, do get past those first couple of chapters. I promise it, it's not nearly as depressing as it sounds. And I, I hope today's discussion uh, with Brian has has helped you see that. But um, Brian, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Um, if people are are excited about uh, hearing what you have to say, is there a good way? And now I'm going to probably end up pointing people back to social media here, but what's the best way for people to find you? <laughs> yeah. Well, a good start is brianmclaren.net and the, a lot of my resources are available there. Awesome. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. And uh, will you come back and join us again sometime? I, I would very much like to. And I just want to say thanks for all the good work you're doing. I mean, to understand the importance of clean water. Oh, my goodness. I'm Yeah. So thanks for the good you're doing. It's huge. Pleasure to, yeah. to be, be with you. Well, thanks for helping us get the word out. Uh, folks, we're here every single Thursday. We release an episode of the Impact Nations podcast. You can find it on YouTube uh, at Impact Nations uh, or uh, wherever your uh, podcasts are released. If you like the audio versions, Apple or what have you, uh, listen to that on the way to work. Be sure to subscribe. Hit the little bell so you get notifi notified, all that stuff. Um, but we'll see you again next week. God bless you. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.